Perhaps everybody has been haunted by this gigantic formula and statistics, the correlation coefficient. In this video, we'll try to demystify the concept of correlation and together get to a final product. An important revelation that's used everywhere, ranging from biochemistry to economics. But then we are asked to memorize the formula without even trying to understand the intuition behind it. To get the intuition behind it, let us first plot all the points that are formed by one data of the first row acting as x coordinate and the corresponding data of the second row acting as y coordinate. Since we are trying to build a linear model, we'd want all the data to be expressed as some sort of linear function, basically a line in the graph. If we firstly assume that the data x is correct as per our model, then a function y equals to mx plus c can be created such that y is the predicted corresponding data. Similarly, if y is considered to be correct as per our model, a function x is equals to wy plus p can be created so that x is the predicted corresponding data in the function. Of course, the screen is not showing the perfectly correlated model. For a perfect correlation, x should depend on y as much as y depends on x. So the lines would basically overlap for a perfectly correlated system. To mathematize what I just said, why don't we pick more closely at the two equations? The second equation can be rearranged into the form of the first equation so that they can be compared with each other. So let's do that firstly. Since for a perfect correlation, the two equations should always represent the same line, we should be able to equate both of the equations. That way, for a perfect correlation, 1 by w equals to m, which follows that 1 equals wm. Now that piece of information is worth noting for future reference. This makes the heart of the formula that we are delving deep into today. Let's be somewhat regressive, shall we? Let's go back with the line with an equation y equals to mx plus c. How do we even get the line from the points after you plot them from the data? To understand that, we need to firstly calculate the error that our line is making when predicting the value of y when x is given. Why don't we draw straight lines that join the actual value of y and the line predicted value of y? Let's call them residuals for a moment. Now we can do something. Why don't I just make a function which is equal to sum of all residuals squared? I'll explain why everything is happening in a little bit. Please follow me along for a while. Then in that particular setting, the function will be equal to the summation of y minus yi squared where y is the predicted value while yi is the actual value. Since we know that our prediction comes from this function in the screen y is equal to mx plus c, it does not hurt to replace y by mxi plus c where xi is the actual value of the data. So what do we have now? A function that's going to hold tremendous amount of importance in understanding linear regression model. Now that's all right, some curious minds might have questions burning about the function that just seems to have been produced out of thin air. Why squared residuals could be the first question, or why not residuals themselves as they are could be another question. Firstly, understand that what we're gonna do in a few moments is going to involve minimization of the function that is just created. We'd want to minimize the residuals or the errors, that's always what the ideal plan is. But then, if we have net residuals equal to zero, it does not ensure that the line has been predicted extremely well, with no errors as we'd expect it to be. Because sometimes, even a badly predicted line can have zero residuals, the positive and negative residuals cancel each other out. Now squaring solves the problem neatly, because there are only positive values of residual squared. Then comes the question of what minimization means when numbers are allowed to move anywhere from negative infinity to positive infinity. We cannot qualitatively talk about minimization when you use residuals. We could move to negative infinity, a very badly predicted line still could say that it has a minimum residual. But that is absurd, right? Now the question could also be why not absolute value of residuals? The answer is that squaring the residuals exaggerates the points that are away from the line. Say a residual of 0.5 would be given a value of just 0.25, but a residual of 5 would be given a value of 25. 
This function would be favoring points that are nearer to the line. The farther the point, the more square error it accumulates. Now the other question could be why not use a cubic or a hundredth power of residual summed up? Wouldn't that make a better function or something? Now I'm not completely sure about the answer and if you do know it, feel free to drop it in the comment section. But here's my best guess. The outliers will get a very large value if we raise the residuals to a very high power. That way, residuals will sway the line towards itself. I call that hyper-exaggeration. The other guess would be how square functions work neatly with calculus when you try to minimize the function in the next section. So here we go. What we would like to do in this section is to minimize the square error of the function that we just created. How about looking at the graph of the function? What we basically need to do is find the minimum of the function. Let's look at the shape of the parabola I formed. The 3D parabola seems to clearly have a minimum. What we are doing is trying to find m and b that make the function minimum. So firstly we take partial derivative of the function with respect to c and set that equal to 0 because that's what or that's where the minimum of the function lie with respect to c. Let's call that c mean. Remember that c min is not the minimum value possible of c. c min is the value of c that makes the function minimum at that point. Through algebraic manipulation, as we always do, you can very easily find the value of c min. In this case, which will be equal to y bar minus mx bar, where y bar and x bar are means of the data provided. What would be an interesting observation in this case is the fact that we get y bar is equals to mx bar plus c min which basically means that the optimum line that we are talking about should compulsorily pass through the point which is formed by the means of data as coordinates. Interesting, isn't it? Now the same drill, partial derivative with respect to m, we have already got the minimum value of c set aside that makes calculations a lot easier, doesn't it? Then we use the product rule again and then use the chain rule again and boom! You go on to find the value of m mean. Now you could have always done this differently as well. Firstly, you could find the value of c min, then m min separately, and solve two linear equation to get the value of c min and m min. Why don't you just check it that way and post it in the comment box below. After algebraic manipulation, you're gonna get the same values of m min and c min. So here we have the slope m of the line y equals to mx plus c. But then the slope m is just the slope of one line where y is predicted. If you follow the same drill, it should not be any harder to get the slope and x-intercept of another line where x is predicted from y. Firstly, what we do is plot the points as we did earlier, then instead of drawing the residual lines of y, draw the residual lines of x on the predicted line. And then go on with creating a function and minimizing it. I'm sure you'll be able to work that out very easily. So we have slopes of both the lines when one predicts x from y and other predicts y from x. Now from the piece of information or note that we just made earlier, remember in the second section, for perfect correlation wm should be equal to 1 and for no correlation wm should be equal to 0 as even if w equals to 0 or m equals to 0, it will mean that y is not dependent on x or vice versa. So to measure the perfectness of correlation, why don't we just introduce a variable r square equals to m dot u, m dot w. That way w and m will get to have equal representation r, thus a measure of correlation. 1 being perfect and 0 being no correlation. And through simple multiplication and squaring, we can easily find the value of r which in fact has a very interesting physical interpretation. I'll cover that in some future video. But if we go on solving the final product and do some replacements, you can also reach a formula that's more widely used in high school books and is taught to students. Go give it a try. Understand that my motive in making these animations is not to show you how to solve an equation or show you a step-by-step -step procedure. It's merely to show you what leads where and help you understand the underlying foundation of any concept. And to me, that's a key that's been missing in our educational system. So here you have 
the correlation coefficient simplified. How is that? That's it for today's episode. See you in the next one. Thanks for catching.